This is Roger Mason Jr., 11-year NBA vet, current co-founder and CEO of Vaunt, and this is The Game Plan. Roger Mason, thank you so much for joining us on The Game Plan today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So look, you played uh, 10 years in the NBA and you know, you've had a lot of different roles over uh, your time since. Would love to understand, you know, as we kick things off, when did you start thinking about life after basketball and what came next for you? Yeah, no, I am um, really my rookie year. You know, the minute I got to the NBA, uh, I was hurt during the draft. So, um, you know, I fell in the draft and, and not being able to play right away gives you a lot of time off the court. So I was I was actually thinking about, you know, I didn't think it was going to be any time soon, but I was thinking about what I would do um, if I couldn't play. And um, I kind of took that approach uh, throughout my career um, as far as preparing myself. I never wanted to be one of those guys where my phone stopped ringing and a team didn't want me and then I was kind of just caught. So I, I always wanted to be over prepared. Yeah, what were some of the ways that you started to you know, reach out and, and I guess find different opportunities? Because uh, I think a, a lot of guys, you know, they, they feel like when they're on the court, when they're playing, it's all about the wins. It's all about being with the team. What were some of the ways that you tried to expand beyond that a little bit? Yeah, some of it was um, just curiosity as far as the business and how much revenue was being generated. So I, I dove into the Players Association as a rookie. I wanted to understand the dynamic. I wanted to understand the dynamic between the media rights deals and all those things. So Part of it was really exposure and working my way up from a player rep to the executive committee to the first vice president um, and really just ingraining myself in the business side. And then the other the other thing was I was just a natural kind of entrepreneur. So um, when I was playing, you know, I was starting several businesses and, you know, unfortunately at the time that wasn't so popular. And, and um, you know, sometimes teams thought you weren't focused on basketball if you were doing other things. And so I was still in an era where it wasn't really popular to do, to be doing other things. So I, I might have played longer than 11 years in the NBA had it not been uh, for that. Uh, but but I would definitely wouldn't be where I am as an entrepreneur. Yeah, it's funny how that's completely changed. We've had guests more from your era, I'll call it, uh, of the NBA. And it was definitely more of a stigma. And nowadays, everybody's got a podcast. Everyone's got a show. Um, they're doing amazing things with content, like on your platform, Vaunt, which we'll talk about. But you mentioned working your way up all the way to first vice president of the MBPA, and the PA came so far in your career and has had such an impact on the game. You look at the game now and the role and um, place that players have at the table that they just didn't have when you first came into the league. Talk to us a little bit about that and the role you played in that evolution. Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely true. Um, I think uh, while I was still playing, you know, we had kind of a moment in time, right? Um, our executive director, you know, we we made a move and, and had him leave the union. And it was a moment in time where it was actually the executive committee really running things without an executive director. Um, and then the Donald Sterling fiasco happened. So um, you have a, a moment in time where it's a really a, a, a breaking point with the players. Um, Adam Silver starting as a new commissioner. Um, and so, you know, it was really an opportunity for Chris Paul, James Jones, myself, Iguodala, um, all the folks on the executive committee to step up and um, get a little bit more exposure to the business of the Players Association than most executive committees ever have, uh, given the fact we didn't have an NED. So you carved out this role for yourself in the PA and, you know, by all external accounts, like had every kind of opportunity you would want to have into the future uh, within the PA, but you decided to kind of do something new, different, bigger. What led you to then want to try and start your own league with the big yeah, three? Well, well, when I was a player, I was still on the executive committee and I had a contract offer with another NBA team <clears throat> and I got... Michelle Roberts offered me the position to be the deputy executive director. So that was the first step after I played. And um, when I retired, uh, the reason I retired is because it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to be the number two, uh, revitalize the union. I had a vision for a new facility, had a vision for all these great things and hiring all these awesome people. So that experience was great. I went back to school, I went to Columbia Business School. Um, and um, while I was there, we did another collective bargaining agreement and I just, you know, my entrepreneurial bug, it just kind of hit me. And so 
the the idea and the goal was for me to start my company called Vaunt. Um, and so I was planning on leaving to start Vaunt and uh, Ice Cube and his partner approached me and asked me if I would help them start the big three, given my background in sports and, and all the retired players that I knew. So um, I accepted that. I, I wrote the official rules for the big three. I recruited all the players and we started a league and it was a great experience. Um, and, you know, like some things, it didn't it doesn't always end uh, the way you want it to. But it was a great experience and, uh, you know, something that I learned a lot from. Yeah, one, one of the things that I think Tim and I as investors, you know, we, we love to work with entrepreneurs that are doing something for the second time because you feel like you get you exercise those muscles a little bit on your first company. And the second time around, you're a little bit, you know, just a little bit more more aware of some of the pitfalls. So knowing how sort of things ended with the big three and, and you know, it ended up becoming a little bit more public than I'm sure folks would have hoped. Help us understand some of the lessons that you took away from that experience that are now informing the way you're building Vaughn. Yeah, you know, without going too much into the detail, I, it's very important who you partner with. And, um, you know, in, in that scenario, I was unfamiliar with a lot of the people that I was doing business with. And, and I just tell myself as I move forward, I, you know, I really do my due diligence. I, I really make sure I understand, you know, all, all the people that are involved. Um, and, you know, life is about lessons. And so some of them are, are louder than others. Um, that situation with the big three worked out great for me. Um, it was a blessing in disguise and, um, you, you learn from it, but I think for Vaughn, you know, understanding, um, that I, you know, I was able to start a league, um, was very empowering. Um, a lot of work to do that. And I had some great people that I did work with there. Yeah. And Roger, you and I met, uh, actually in your role as entrepreneur, because you had started Vaunt, I was leading the Global Sports Venture Studio with the Dodgers and Elysian Park Ventures at the time. And t take us through that process. Well, first of all, let's get into Vaunt uh, for our audience who's maybe not as familiar. Tell us what it is. Yeah, so Vaunt is a sports and entertainment IP development content platform. And so what we do is we create uh, live, repeatable micro competitions um, with athletes and entertainers that can be bet on and have live media rights and sponsorship revenue. Um, and then on the other side of Vaunt, we create content um, and shows, uh, unscripted shows that we sell to different distribution partners like Facebook and Netflix and um, Amazon and all the normal buyers of content. But uh, we're creating IP that, that we think is very valuable and you know, doing it with a lot of the athletes and celebrities that you all know. Yeah, and going into it was that vision for selling IP uh, and all of the new kind of entrance into the space, whether it be Apple, Netflix, Amazon, others, you know, was that kind of the idea was, oh, there's a whole new appetite and market for content? Or did you kind of evolve the business as you got into it? We definitely evolved the business as we got into it. I think Vaunt 1.0, we were about five years ahead of our time. Um, if you think about Vaunt 1.0, it was actually celebrities and athletes having their own channel, similar to our OnlyFans. So we built an app and product that could do that. But um, Instagram was just becoming popular. We were a little bit early on that. And so, as you know, uh, for founders and CEOs, the number one thing you got to be able to do is adjust and, and pivot. And so with so many buyers of content out there, we thought a strategy was much stronger for us to supply those buyers with content that they couldn't get and, and own the IP um, and just license that out. So, Raj, let's talk about the, the broader trend a little bit, I think, before we jump into some of the work that you guys have already done with Vaunt. We're, we're starting to see this shift from athletes and entertainers broadly, you know, being employees on shows to now saying that they actually want to be owners. Talk to us a little bit about maybe when you started seeing that shift and what are some of the ways that you're, you're seeing it manifest now with uh, content creators actually wanting to now be IP owners? I think it's just an overall paradigm shift with uh, athletes, entertainers overall over the last decade. You look at, you know, I think the leaders and the folks that a lot of people pay attention to, the, the Michael Jordans and the Jay-Zs of the world who kind of we grew up in, in, and saw uh, the influence that they had with products, the influence they, they had with um, ownership. And so I think, you know, it got the mind kind of working that way. Everyone remembers LeBron um, and Maverick Carter. Uh, taking a position in Beats and and that doing really well. And so I think from a content standpoint, it's no different. I think it's uh, one of those things where rather than um, allowing another platform to, to, to monetize 
uh, those guys that they want to participate in the ownership side of that as well. And I think, you know, those are the trends that we've been seeing over the last decade. And what are some of the ways that you're able to, to I guess, work with these athletes or with these entertainers broadly to, to help them, you know, actually like take, take ownership from the business side, right? Because I think it's one thing to be on, on, on camera and sort of be camera talent. And then there's another to say, okay, well, now I actually have to do audience development and social engagement and all the other things that maybe folks aren't necessarily as used to doing. So, so where do you kind of step into that, that value chain? Yeah, I think, you know, first step, what we were able to do is we did a five-year partnership with the NBA Players Association, and we gave them some equity in Vaunt. So uh, really, every NBA player, you know, has a vested interest in our company. But two, you know, on a case-by-case basis, you know, if there are athletes or entertainers that are part of a particular franchise that we're creating, uh, we offer them some skin in the game. We offer them some some real equity and upside on top of their talent fees as well. So it's a nice combination. And we try to make it easy. You know, we're not these guys, uh, we always said this as players, keep the main thing the main thing, and, and that's what's paying the bills. Um, there's a lot of time for you to do other things, which is important, but we want to, at Vaughn, we want to take some of those responsibilities off the athlete's hands and, and really make it a, a, a great experience for them. As you've moved, you know, with each year, kind of another year away from the league, how has that changed your connection to the players and how have you been able to still keep that strong as you facilitate content and relationships for Vaughn? Yeah. You know, uh, every year I, I become someone else's OG. So <laughs> just, I keep on piling on these young players, but, um, you know, I did some consulting stuff with the Denver Nuggets as a scout. Um, so, you know, I like that stuff. I love the game. So it keeps me uh, around the game. It, it keeps me, you know, seeing all the players. I don't do that now, obviously. Um, but I watch so much basketball and we're lucky. We have a, a shareholder uh, by the name of True Capital. They've got over 200 athletes and uh, I still have a lot of friends that are playing and that I talk to all the time. So um, I actually make a point to make sure I stay connected uh, make sure I know what's going on. Uh, very close with Michelle Roberts at the Players Association as well. And, and players reach out to me about all kinds of things, you know, whether it was the bubble, uh, whether it's advice on, you know, business and things like that. So uh, definitely stay active. You mentioned at the tail end of your career, you already had the idea for Vaughn. And what really were you drawn to? Was it the idea of player driven? and led narrative and content? Was it the operational side? Was it the unique opportunity with somebody like the PA to connect with that? Like what of all those elements did you really feel like was the thing to get excited about as an entrepreneur? Yeah. So it was a couple of things. So, so Vaunt was the third company that my, the co-founder and I started. So the first company we started, we were young. We're, I'm from DC. He's from DC. And I was playing for the hometown wizards. And everybody would come in town and they'd ask me, the young guy, like, Raj, you're from D.C. Where can we hang out on a, on a Monday? And so after about a month of telling these guys where to come, um, I, I decided, you know what, we should just start a promoting company. All these NBA guys are asking me where to go. We'll do it on Monday since our games are Tuesdays and let's get them you know, out all night so it can help, help the team. And, uh, and we did that. We made a quarter million dollars the first year off of one you know, event that we did. But the most important thing it did is it showed me that I could connect with the football guys, the baseball guys, and all the, the top guys in DC. So my, my business partner kind of took that and scaled it. We did over a million in revenue the next year. That was the first business, but it connected us with all sports and entertainment. Second business we started was actually a record label. Um, we had success with that. We did a joint venture with Universal Republic and Monty Littman. And for me, I was choosing teams that I wanted to play on based on what I had going on with business. So I signed with the Knicks because we did this deal with Universal. I took about $600,000 less to go to New York because I wanted to meet everybody in that market. Um, and so we did that deal. And with our artists, as we were you know, pumping her up, nobody knew who she was. So we put these cameras in the studio house and started shooting what was back then called reality TV. Now we just call it content. Um, and so as we kind of flushed through the, the music, I started getting more involved in the Players Association and understanding the group licensing rights. And we had a lockout. And during a lockout, the players were like, man, we can now we're not in contract. We could go do our own thing. Like we could go do an exhibition game. And we had some folks in Dubai. We had all these people talking about different things we could do off the court. And it got my mind thinking that, all right, well, when we do come back to play, there's a bunch of things that we can do off the court 
to really monetize athletes. Um, there's these star musicians that nobody really knows who they are, so there's some content there. And we've got connectivity to basketball, football, baseball through our promoting business. So we kind of formed Vaunt based on the three opportunities that we had throughout our, the end of our careers. So how do you you're see a man, yourself? You're a man before your time, for sure. I mean, <laughs> I'm thinking like every, every example you gave him like, oh, yeah, and then Durant went to the Warriors and became like a tech investor in the Bay Area. And, and then, you know, another guy started a media company. That was it. You know, it's like very much – present by you to kind of be ahead of all of those things yeah no it's crazy it's crazy to see all that stuff happen <laughs> yeah, yeah well you know it's, it's like they say in venture capital right it's uh it's too early too early too no that's early that's uh cole's saying <laughs> that's, that, cole's that's cole's saying <laughs> <laughs> you, jay that i get that from cole who roger and i both know and roger i know you've heard that before which is too early too early too early too late it all it all comes full circle to um i was gonna ask roger you know how do you see yourself uh in terms of you know as a business as a production house right typically as a production house folks are let's say writing a check uh to have somebody go do a pilot and then you come back and you you know, either you'll, you'll sell it based on the pilot or you'll green light a season because you feel like that it's going to have some legs so that's sort of one model the other model is that when when talent actually wants to own it they they go and self-create it and then they come to somebody to, to basically be the promoter to actually sell it onto these platforms. Um, is, there, is there one set model that you guys try to do with the content that you create or is it a, is it a hybrid? Yeah, so we, we don't do either of those actually. So we like a cleaner model with us have, putting less money out front. Um, and so what we really so specialize in is, is creating the sports and entertainment IPs, creating that content concept with our partners, whether it's NBA players, uh, Post Malone, for example, we did um, the Facebook beer pong tournament with Post, Celebrity World Pong League. Um, and that was a very big deal for us. Ten episodes, different celebrities. And so just as an example, you know, we partnered with B-17, who did our production. Um, we packaged and pitched the concept that Post gave us to Facebook and others. Facebook loved it. And so we presented, you know, the deal to both the talent and the production company, um, and we monetized on both sides of those. So um, it for us, very low overhead, very clean, leverage the relationships we have, the creative we have on our team. Um, and, and then that was an example of a content series that we sold for, um, you know, for our live competitions that we do. That's a little bit different, but we partner with a financer who pays uh, for the operation and we bring the IP and we bring the talent and we do a distribution split, but it's very clean for us, um, because it, we don't have to spend a whole lot of money, um, in actually producing the content. Yeah, that was going to be my, my question. Cause I think generally speaking, I think venture investors have a tough time investing in media because they look at it like, well, they're taking the venture risk in a business. And then you're also taking that investment risk. If you're going to be underwriting, a bunch of different shows and generally speaking that that's kind of how that model works right you, you underwrite a bunch of shows one of them becomes bridgerton or tiger king or whatever and then that's how your your platform ends up paying back with you guys it seems like it's it's more of a you're taking the ip and then there's probably somebody else that you're you're under you know raising the underwriting capital from got it got it so so what's i guess been the the most challenging thing uh in terms of as you're building out this ip and content is it is it getting the talent on board? Is it the ideas themselves or, or something else? I think it's just really been timing, honestly. You know, I think now is the right time, right? So like we've been talking about doing these alternative competitions the last two or three years. The Mike Tyson, Roy Jones Jr. fight just happened, right? So yeah, now people yeah. are thinking about, okay, there are some alternative competitions happening, right? The Tiger Woods versus Phil Mickelson match, that just happened. So I think the, for the us, Paul brothers. Brothers. yeah, the Logan Paul, Jay Paul. So I think for us, it was really about, um, you know, staying with it and continuing to evolve. Um, and, you know, these these things take time, take time. You know, it's, that's the bottom line. But I think now we're in a great spot where um, kind of the timing is aligned with what our business is. And uh, especially with sports betting taking off. And we're a big supplier of micro competitions for micro bets. Right. That's you know, that's one of the big areas for us in revenue is creating these competitions that can be bet on as more and more states allow for legalized betting. We want to be a platform that's creating these competitions for that. Is that like something this, that it, you're going to try to build 
into the platform itself? Or is that something you're thinking about partnering with, you know, a, a, a sports book that's already doing something like that? Yeah, we're, we've, we're in talks with a, a couple, um, a couple companies that actually do that and create the micro bets for your fan duels, for your DraftKings, for your MGM. So we're working on a deal uh, with one of those companies right now. Um, and, you know, down the line, who knows what can happen. But uh, but for now, we're partnering. I was just going to say I like this because it's another one of those things I think that you're ahead of the curve on. And we'll be looking back at this in a year or two. And that's kind of going to be the most common way that content goes. So that's really exciting. Um, in that same vein, you know, what else are you kind of most excited about as you look into the next couple of years? Yeah. So uh, as a founder and CEO, I'm most excited about the over 75 SPACs uh, and, and the billions of dollars in, in, in SPACs that are out there. Because for us, uh, there's a lot of 25, over 25 sports and, and entertainment focused SPACs. So as we look at, you know, bringing in more capital to scale the business, um, that's exciting. And so I'm, I'm certainly excited about, you know, what's going on there. There's only so many deals. Um, and so, you know, for us, we execute the way we're supposed to execute. We could be in a really good position in the next 16 to, to 24 months. I think that's Talk really refreshing. It's, it's great to hear it from the entrepreneur side about how exciting the SPAC outlook is. But Jay, I know you were going to ask something in that same vein. Uh, all good. Yeah, so I was going to say, talk to us a little bit about some of the fundraising that you guys have, have done to date. You know, this is not your first business, so I assume that you've gone through the sort of fundraising process. But from what I hear, it never gets easy for entrepreneurs. So talk to us about what that process was like and, and maybe some of the investors you brought on board. Yeah, no. Um, so when I first had the idea, it was we had a deck and a concept. And um, as you guys know, um, a, a seed round is really just investing in the founder. So I raised uh, around 1.8 million. Um, we put a valuation of 10 out there based on some of the market comps that we said we saw. And um, anyone from Leo Henry, who's the founder of the Yes Network, um, to uh, you know, we we got uh, the the Dodgers, Elysian and Parker now shareholders. We did a convertible note um, for the Series A before the Series A. They came in on that. Um, Tony Robbins, the motivational speaker, um, is an investor. Um, we got a number of guys. The CEO from Wish um, is coming in on our Series A right now, um, which very different than you know a year from a year ago and, and two years ago. Um, it was a fight to raise money, right? We we had we were pre revenue. Um, you know we had been around for a little while already, and and so didn't have a whole lot of traction. Had some partnerships, but we were kind of sputtering away there um, for for about a year and a half, and it was. It was it was it was a tough time for sure, and then we had a breakthrough um, during the pandemic, and did you know a fourteen and a half million dollar deal with uh, with Facebook, wow. and that that kind of got things going, um, brought in some some revenue obviously, and now uh, we'll, we'll probably be in a situation for the Series A where over we'll, we're going to be oversubscribed, which is a which is going to be a, a a very different feeling than uh, <laughs> than the last you know the last few rounds. Leverage. And, and that Facebook round, that's to do with the things like the Post Malone content that you had mentioned. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so we'll ask you a question that we only can really ask the entrepreneurs on our show. Uh, you can come back. It, it's a question of wh what would you ask us as investors or what's the call out of VCs out there given the, the journey you've been on as an entrepreneur? Yeah. You know, the two VCs that we have in Vaughn, um, Elysian Park and M Ventures, quite frankly, they, they've been great. You know, I think, uh, and you know, Cole, Cole is honest, um, but he, he, what I love about him is he makes us think about things that maybe, you know, we hadn't thought about um, because he's so meticulous. So, um, but he's a big believer and big supporter. And so I got nothing but love for him for that. And, and the same with M Ventures with Charles King. Some of the other VCs that we've seen and talked to, um, you know, some some people just don't understand the, the media and content space, and that's okay. You know, it, I, I'm somebody that uh, was told I would never make it to the NBA. Like I was told that constantly in my life. So, if a VC sees what we're doing and they and they don't want to invest or they, they don't get it, I, I feel like it's really their loss. I'm not mad. I'm not upset or anything like that. And I, you know, I just kind of think they just don't see it, and which is fine. But the mentality I have as an athlete is it's that way because. You know, you're told there's no way you're going to make that dream happen. And, and uh, I happen to do it. 
Well, I appreciate that sentiment. And I'll just call myself out because I I passed on Vaunt, right? I didn't invest in maybe that same note as a lesion. And at the end of the day, it's one of those, it's not you, it's me type things, whereas not quite the right timing as I was leading the Global Sports Venture Studio and just kind of focused on the 10 different clients I had. But I'm really happy to see how well you guys have done and continue to do. And it's really exciting to hear that um, you're oversubscribed and you know the, the, the tables have turned, so to speak. Uh, that's really <laughs> exciting. A lot to look forward to. Yeah, for sure. Not to, not to put Tim on the spot uh, there, but maybe we can, Roger. What were some of the, the biggest objections that you heard from investors, whether it was Tim or other ones, as you were going through this process? Yeah, you know, and I, I'm glad, Tim, I'm glad you reminded me of that because I didn't even remember that you didn't invest. But I thought you were involved through um, Elysian Park um, in some way with the, with the studio. It, this it, is the point where Roger hangs up the Zoom and says, sorry, guys, I got to go. No. <laughs> real talk, man, real talk. I appreciate never, it. Never that. But, um, but I think, you know, what we heard was uh, well, you're, you're early, a little early, a little early for us. Um, and we were early, to be honest with you. We, we, we had no revenue. Uh, we didn't have any real traction. We had a vision. We had some partnerships and some relationships, but um, I could very easily see how someone wouldn't invest back then. Um, just under, just being realistic about where things where things are. Thankfully for us, we had some people that really believed in me, really believed in Brad, really believed in the space, um, and supported us. And if it, if it wasn't for those folks that supported us, you know, we may not be where we are today. So some of it, you know, we're, we're lucky, we're blessed. Um, but I totally get why, you know, a couple of years ago, someone could have passed on Vaughn. Yeah. And I think yeah, it, it, when I think back it, to it too, I remember how kick-ass, I mean, your content obviously is now, but then it was, you had the Antonio Brown piece, I think um, you had a Pele piece like, and uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And I was coming out of my Vice Media days and it was like the, the most kind of, um, I guess, own identity like it had the content had its own identity that was clear like it was vaunt and i think i also had kind of baggage and was jaded from almost seeing too much media stuff and the smart investors were the ones who were focused on partnerships with the pa and your relationships and a future of uh micro events and micro betting so sometimes our own uh experiences i mean well that's kind of the case of life right like our own experiences (laughs) influence our decisions but um your vision has come to fruition again. So I'll, I'll only continue to sing your praise. Appreciate it, man. We're getting there. Got to execute yeah, it all. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Well, that, that's, that's really where the, uh, the rubber meets the road, right? So Roger, you've been so gracious with your time with us today. I think we'll, we'll wrap on a question that uh, we love to get, not only because it's helpful to other athletes that are listening, but also to the, the entrepreneurs that we know tune in. Knowing what you know now uh, with the businesses that you've built and, and are building, what is some advice that you would give your, your younger self? Um, that's a great question. Um, that's a really great question. I think, you know, advice that I would give my younger self with starting, um, a a business is really to understand, um, how expensive the venture is. I think when we first started Vaunt, we didn't really appreciate the amount of cost with creating a content platform and how expensive it was, especially back then to create content. Now technology is caught up. You can do some stuff with you know, cheaper cameras and it still looks great and it's HD quality 4K. But um, back then I didn't appreciate the the amount of cost it was going to be for us. I think the other thing is don't be shy um, to speak to other uh, CEOs and founders and and, and people that have done it. And one of the things that happens with athletes a lot of times is we're so competitive. And so we don't want to share any information. We kind of want to keep things to ourselves. And so um, what I've learned as I've gotten older is collaboration is great. Um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. There's a lot of things you can take from people that have been there. And so I, I would tell my younger kind of more hothead self to to relax a little bit on the competitiveness and kind of uh, see what's been done and what's out there a little bit more. Well, Roger, that's awesome. We appreciate your time and thanks for joining us on the game plan. Absolutely. Anytime, guys. Yeah.